The True American Murder and Mercy in Texas. And as I was reading it, uh, the title, you think about the title through the whole time you're reading the book, it shows up. Sometimes you listen to a song and the song has a certain name and you never hear that phrase in the song and you wonder why it's called that, but the true American does show up in, in the text of this book, but you're thinking about what a true American is all the time because along with being just a great story, it is a very American story for the 21st century and a meditation on what being a true American really means at this point where we're about to begin another family fight about what being an American is. I mean, we're gearing up for it. You can feel it happening uh, just in time for 2016 as if we don't have other fish to fry. Anand Giridharadas, um, wonderful piece of work. How did you find your star, your true character, your core of the book, Rais? So I was, um, I had finished a first book in, published it in 2011, uh, and it was about returning to the India that my parents had emigrated from to the United States. And I had moved back there after college to kind of write about the transformation of India and how kind of their India had become a very different India. And that was a very optimistic book um, because over that generation in India, things have really, maybe for the first generation in many, many generations, started to turn very optimistic. And I came back here in 2009 and started reporting on this country and noticed that a lot of, I was telling a lot of the same stories but in reverse. A lot of the same processes that I was writing, you know, individuals feeling more of a sense of control over their destiny. Um, people, for example, living in smaller and smaller families in India because they could afford to and, you know, all these things were going in reverse. You st we're starting to have what the Census Bureau called the huddle household in America. People, you know, huddling together because kids couldn't afford to live on their own. Literally Indian development backwards. Um, and it occurred to me that there was something there to tell. And so I actually spent a year looking for stories that would allow me to kind of explore what was going on with the American dream. And it took a very long time. Um, and one day I saw in the newspaper a story about that basically said, news brief, uh, that basically said, a man in Texas is scheduled to be executed tonight. Nothing so unusual so far. Um, in his final days, his, one of his victims, Raisuddin Buyan, slightly interesting name for a Texas death penalty case, has been fighting a campaign to save his life. And, and you know, you and I are both in the news business. You, there's actually not that many stories that are new. Most stories are regurgitations. That, I just, it occurred to me in that moment that I'd never heard of anything like that. And I spent a couple hours that morning just digging into who was this guy who went immigrant Arab hunting, as he called it, in the month after 9-11, went around to three gas stations, shot three clerks in three Dallas gas stations. Two of them died, third one survived. And this third survivor, a Muslim immigrant from Bangladesh, um, rebuilds his life in this kind of wonderfully American way from the very bottom, um, and manages 10 years later to find it within himself to, to not only forgive um, his attacker in the name of mercy, in the name of his religion, Islam, uh, but also to fight Governor Perry and the entire Texas establishment to save Mark Stroman's life from the death penalty. And the last thing I'll say about it is, you know, I started by saying kind of the American dream not working. And at one level, this was just this story of these two guys, and it was an amazing story of two people. Um, but it became very clear to me very quickly as I dug in that this story was really about the collision of two Americas, one that was still working better than any society in the history of the world has ever worked, and is still very much with us. And it's not just a one percenters America, it's a pretty, pretty large and thriving America. And an America that's failed a long time ago and we don't talk about. And when that shooting happened of Mark Stroman and Reis Bouillon, a hurting, the hurting America, the kind of under nation, collided with this thriving America, and it was the it was the immigrant from the third world who was shot in the face, who was still able to access an America that still worked, and this kind of white working class guy from Dallas who, who grew out of and failed out of an America that, that failed him. Yeah, I want to spend some time talking about Mark Stroman because he, as you note, tells us a story about what it is to be American right now.
But let's talk a little bit more about race because if you know people in a big metropolitan area, if you live in a big metropolitan area, and people come here from all over, so I'm not going to speak for you, but you've probably met somebody like this uh, in love with this country from afar, even before they got here, uh, optimistic in ways that are almost unfathomable as you sort of plod along in your own life and think about all the things you're not doing and haven't been able to accomplish. And uh, every bit of yardage they scramble for, they think of as victory. They are inspiring and sometimes even puzzling uh, because they can be sitting at the bottom of the deck and feel like the luckiest guy uh, there is. And th there's something wonderful and, uh, and a reminder when you're with, with those guys. Uh, tell us more about his background and how he, how he comes to be in a Texas convenience store. You know, race, Buyan, I, I, I've always said they're kind of two broad ways a lot of people got to America as immigrants. Um, and the more kind of exciting story is people fleeing really horrible circumstances, religious persecution, 17th century, or the Holocaust, or, you know, and, and, and a bunch of immigrants came that way. Um, but a, we sometimes forget that a, a great many people who came here were fleeing perfectly decent circumstances. Um, and were often the only brother out of six siblings to choose to come here. And everybody else was kind of fine with their lives. And so over the generations, I think just in the kind of gene pool of this country, and there actually has been genetic some work showing that this is kind of gene associated with bungee jumping and other risk taking that Americans have in vastly higher proportion than any other country in the world. Because it's just been peopled over the generations by slightly crazy bungee jumpers who feel the need to, to leave when others didn't. And so all of which is to say, Race Bouillon is kind of from that latter camp. He had a great life. He, he would have done very well in Bangladesh he, if he had said He would never stayed. have driven his own car. He would have been a chauffeur driven all his life. He was a, an Air Force officer in Bangladesh. Bangladesh, as some of you may know, is very involved in peacekeeping around the world, one of the most important. So he would have been a kind of admiral in, in, in peacekeeping around the world. Uh, would have been driven around, would have had country club memberships, privileged life. He grew up in, in privilege and, and managed even within his family to kind of um, end up with an even higher position. And yet, like so many of our ancestors, my, my, my father uh, just had this sense that what was perfectly fine for most people wasn't enough for him. And there was always some longing for something more. And first it was learning IT, and then it was, you know, I want to learn IT in America. It was the late 90s. Everybody thought they were going to make a billion dollars on a startup idea, and he said, I'm going to get in on this IT thing. So he comes to America, and like so many immigrants, and this, this goes to the heart of what's both puzzling and so inspiring, this is an Air Force officer who is willing to now work as a busboy in a French restaurant in Manhattan, as a gas, uh, nighttime gas station clerk in Queens, um, is, is just willing to start from the bottom. To, you know, to, to rise, you must first fall, um, and ends up in Dallas because an old schoolmate from his, when he's in New York two years, races, and an old schoolmate from Bangladesh calls him one day. He doesn't place the voice at first, but then he remembers. And he says, you know, I'm in, you remember me? I'm in, I'm, in, I'm in Texas now, and you should come here and come visit me. It's great here. Taxes are low and everything's cheap. And, you know. So race goes down there, and he was happy with New York. But when he went to Texas, he kind of realized that New York was a very high-class version of Bangladesh, right? Very dense, very crowded, kind of maddening. And that Texas was like, if you were really trying to get out of Bangladesh, Texas was the way to do it. Um, and, and the thing that, that he noted was that the bathrooms he found in Dallas were bigger than his bedroom in New York. <laughs> and, and so... Yeah, but uh, when you come out of the bathroom, you're in Texas. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry. <laughs> that's, that's what yeah, I anybody's said. Anybody's from Texas, I'm sorry. Exactly. Yeah, just, just occurred They me. know it's true if they're <laughs> from Texas. Um, and so, and so he, he, he kind of, th and this friend says, I got, my brother and I own a bunch of convenience stores. You have to remember, I mean, my father chose his business school in India just because he had a couple friends applying. I mean, immigrants often don't have a lot of information, even in the age of the internet. So he had some friend, and the friend says, come to Dallas, and my brother and I own a bunch of businesses, and if you work in one for a little while, you'll probably own it soon. Sounds pretty good. So there he is, working at 5 a.m. in the mini mart. And, and so he's working in this gas station. And I think many of us might say, gosh, this is just miserable. But he had this very strong sense that 
I, I have a vision, I have a goal, I'm gonna get married in a couple, I'm gonna go back home, get my fiance, get married, I'm gonna start IT classes in January, I'm gonna do all this stuff, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna rise out of this. And, as a very devout Muslim, he said to himself, Prophet Muhammad was a shepherd. That was a fairly low level job, but he was able to have quite a great destiny. So why should I complain about being a mini-mart clerk? But there he was on a collision course with one Mark Stroman, who comes from a very different world, educated in a very different way, and also sees the very idea of being an American in a fundamentally different way. Tell us about him. And Mark Stroman um, grows out of a, um, a kind of white working class world in and around Dallas, Texas that really has been hurting with each of the last kind of three generations. And you see it in his own family, it, from his grandparents to his parents to him, every generation has gotten worse off. And this is the stuff we kind of read in the paper all the time, like the median wage is declining for the first time, or like the, the male labor participation rate is the lowest it's ever been. These are the kind of abstract things we hear, but this is the world where that is like acutely happening. This is the world that had factory jobs a generation ago where no one has a factory job anymore, right? This is, this is the place that got china and that got automated and got everything else. Um, so he grows out of that world, but he has clearly his own problems in addition to the kind of general problems of that world. He is clearly a, a tormented young man from the very beginning of his life, has you know, horrible nightmares that kind of exceed most children's nightmares. That kind of escalates to petty crimes, you know, slingshots, flung at boys, chrome nunchucks swung around at school, starts getting kicked out of school, um, you know, conceives a child uh, and, and, and f reluctantly marries the mother you know, in his, during his third attempt at eighth grade at age 15, uh, 16. Um, starts to, as so many of our young men are, kind of circulate in and out of the prison system. It's almost a second home, a um, couple months in, a couple months out, little parole here, you know, um, moves into a juvenile detention system that was just 10 years away from being shut down by the courts in Texas because they were so abusive that it was deemed unconstitutional for them to exist. Um, and in some ways, I think of him as passing through kind of three failing institutions in American life, the family, the school system, and then the kind of incarceration system. And you know, liberals might like to emphasize some of those things as being bad, conservatives, others, but they're all failing. And they're failing in different ways, and they're particularly failing our young men, as we know. And so he's kind of a, a product of that. And he's clearly an exceptional guy in his, in his horribleness, because he goes on to commit these crimes. But one thing I just want to note is, anytime I found a name of, of boys he was running around with when he was 10 or 11, because there was a long criminal history that was you know, involved in his death penalty trial, if I, if I found a name and date of birth of someone he was maybe arrested with at age 11 for flinging nunchucks, small stuff, if I ran that name and date of birth today, all of these men were in jail today for violent crimes. So you're looking at a social world in which this is maybe a kind of near universal fate for a certain kind of demographic of men. Um, and he grows out of that world, has very strong views about America being only for Americans, which means people, I guess, born here like whenever he thought the appropriate cutoff was. Um, and he felt that, he felt besieged. I think the, the, the strongest word I can use is besieged. He felt that he had this country and that, and that people like him had this country. And now, you know, liberal big government and immigrants and minorities who were dependent and various other things were kind of nibbling away at the platform that he and his mates stood on. You hear that narrative of loss from men in that class location quite a lot. And yet, in real life, absent immigrants and absent liberals and all these things that are supposedly undermining them, they would hardly be um, streaking like comets across the sky. They're, they're lightly educated, lightly skilled, um, lightly work affiliated, and um, not likely to to do very well, but they do have handy excuses for, for right. why their world is the way it is. And, and, and you know, one thing that I, in the middle of writing this book, um, it was in 2012 campaign, and, and I was watching on TV and I saw Bill Clinton give a speech on Obama's behalf in Ohio. Um, it's a very controversial 
as far as I could tell, and I've never been able to find it online mm. after, so I thought other people might have thought it was a little bit out there as well, but he was extremely honest. And what he said is uh, something that I had never occurred to me before, and I think is a very deep truth that explains a lot of our politics. He basically, he was talking to kind of a white working class audience in Ohio, factory worker kind of demographic. It may have been a factory, it was in the rain, from what I remember. And he said, he, he was kind of reading the script, um, and then he, in, in the typical Bill Clinton way, kind of put the script aside and just talked for like 10 minutes, right? Which terrifies everybody who works for him. Um, and he said something to the effect of, let me, just, let me just level with you here, talking about the economy. He said, you know, I, I am you. I grew up in the same conditions you grew up. Maybe your dad was a drunk like my dad. Maybe, you know, maybe times were tough. Maybe you didn't have money. You were kind of this white guy in this environment. And he kind of, very, very like visceral identification. And he said, the, the, the hard thing about your situation is that the country's fortunes have kind of stagnated broadly. All the data shows that. But if you are a woman, you're still way better off this generation than you were a generation ago because of what's happened for women. If you are black, you're still better off this generation than you were a generation ago what's happened for black people. Same with gay people, same with disabled people, same with any, so even though the country's fortunes have sort of flatlined, your personal liberty as a member of any of those groups has transformed upwardly over the last generation. Aha, but the Mark Stroman's of the world see that transformation as a zero-sum game where all those gains for women and minorities and gays and on and on and on came out of the hide of guys right. like them. And I think that analysis is wrong, but I think what, what Clinton's point was, which is very wise, is that only if you are a kind of working class white male have none of the things that have happened over the last generation benefited you. It's not that you've had things taken away by people, but none of the major transformations from globalization to the rise of women to the kind of empowerment, none of them have benefited you. And, and there's actually only that demographic that hasn't been massively benefited. And so the resentment is understandable even if it's not kind of justifiable. So now we have our antagonist and protagonist, Mark Stroman and Race Bouillon. They collide and in their collision and in his American journey, Race ends up in your pages giving very perceptive critiques of this country. To me, some of the most effective parts of the book, because uh, he sees us so clearly at a time where we're just sort of thrashing around and sometimes unable to see ourselves very clearly. I think what's so interesting about this, and it, it's one of the things that really made me write the book, was, was the opportunity to write about America, not through my eyes or through you know, the eyes of the kinds of people I know, but through this kind of very particular eyes of a Muslim immigrant who saw America in two very distinct ways. One, he was far more bullish on America than most people born here, because you have to remember he was born very far away and like gambled his entire life on coming here, right? So that, that's kind of the, uh, as bullish as you can get on a place. And he truly believes to this day that this is the greatest country in the history of the world, um, that he would have been able to achieve nothing he's been able to achieve anywhere else, but he also saw, and he may never have seen this if he hadn't been shot, because he may have just had that immigrant upwardly thing, gotten his IT classes, lived in a comfortable suburb, and not realized there were all these other people here. Um, but because he was shot, he was brought into confrontation, and then had to go to the trial of this guy, and had to learn about the family of this guy, and then decided on his own later to try to save this guy. Because of his confrontation with that kind of other hurting America, he kind of came to see America as this perfect system and perfect dream whose people were failing to seize the opportunity of it. Um, and he had a bunch of diagnoses about why they were failing to take advantage of the country that he was able to take advantage of despite being shot in the face and half blind. And he felt that there was a huge drugs and alcohol problem. And by the way, and you know, there's something known as the immigrant advantage and life expectancy. Immigrants live longer the native-born Americans because of, in large part, drug and alcohol use. Um, and that, unfortunately for immigrants, your children will lose the advantage and it regresses to the mean pretty quickly. Um, he also felt that the kind of erosion of family was, was astonishing to him. I mean, he, 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 you know, the TV shows he grew up with 
watching America, seemed, people seemed to have families, but in the eastern Dallas neighborhoods that he was living in, like nobody had a family. The, or nobody had a family the way he understood it. People were vague about where their own brothers and sisters were, hadn't spoken to their parents, uh, weren't sure about where their own children were in often. And whose uh, they were. Yeah. Um, and it was almost like the family arrangements were like kind of kaleidoscopic, right? They, uh, for a, a few month period, you'd kind of live with one person, be funded by another person, you know, maybe procreate with a third person and raise that child with a fourth person. And then maybe the next year the kaleidoscope would flip and like all four of those different things and would change. And it's all very fragile. And they weren't linked together. Um, and so, and as he's rebuilding his life, he works at the Olive Garden for two years. In part, he says, to kind of get over his fear of white people um, and, and feels that the Olive Garden would be a great place to do that. Um, and, <laughs> and so he's, he's working as a server at the Olive Garden. And remember, this is an you know, immigrant. He was, he was in this gas station working by himself. This is the first time he really has colleagues in America. And these are kind of working class, not college educated colleagues, native born. And he is astonished about their lives when he talks about them. Just horrible childhood lives, many of them dealing drugs by the time they were teenagers. And, and he just starts over these years to feel that he's come to this country that is the perfect country for whom so many people are unable to, to take advantage of. We have about uh, ooh, five or so minutes before we start taking questions. And uh, there's a microphone over here in the side aisle. So you can queue up there as you think about your elegant, brief points so we can talk to a lot of people. And full points to Anand for not giving us cheap grace or a saccharine happy ending. Of course, the, the story doesn't allow you to do that. But as I was reading it, I was thinking, oh no, is this all going to be tied up in a bow? And you get us all the way to the last couple of pages before we find out we're not exactly going to get that. But you had to think about that as someone plotting out how to tell someone who doesn't know this story what they need to know. You can't make a thriller out of a, a story that has its, it has to hew to what really happened in real life because it's a, a nonfiction book. But you also had to keep in mind what keeps a reader going. Um, how did you come to some of the decisions you did about structure, about uh, where to end Mark Stroman's story and where to continue with Rais and, and, and so on. Because as, as craft, I, I admired the way that was done. You know, what, it, it's, it was one of the most interesting problems in thinking about how to do it because you really have two stories um, that, you know, where these two men only really intersect twice. In 2001, when one shoots the other, and in 2011, when there's a you know, brief two, three month period where there, where one is fighting to save the other. And everything else that happens in the story is parallel, but in their respective worlds. Um, so I didn't want to create a false merger of the story. Um, and so what I decided to do, and I think it was actually partly inspired by, you know, for someone who, who deeply believes in books, I watch an enormous amount of TV. Um, <laughs> because I think, I mean, I honestly think TV is maybe some of the, the most important literature today. I mean, the, the kinds of TV shows we are treated to today are just a, you know, on, a, on a different level from what we've ever seen and better than, I think, what most movies are. And, um, and there's this thing in TV where you kind of, you're with, you're with a scene for a while and then you leave it and come back. And, you know, in Game of Thrones, they use different filtered lights and it's kind of yellow light whenever it's with Khaleesi and kind of brown light whenever it's in Winterfell or whatever. Um, and I think maybe it was a little bit inspired by that to really do the story on these two tracks and keep cutting scenes. And so um, it's about, I don't know, 14 chapters-ish, and um, every chapter goes back and forth. This is kind of a race chapter and a mark chapter, and a race chapter and a mark chapter. Um, and you know, so generally it'll be kind of 2001 to 2002 for race, and then 2001 to mark, and so on. But, but in, in the case of race, for example, his backstory comes early. In the case of Mark, it comes a little bit later during his trial, because death penalty trials are all about your character, actually. Um, and so, so that, that kind of alternating thing. And then that led to another thing which I tried to do, which is I wanted you to feel like you were in these distinct worlds in each of these chapters. So I didn't want it to read with a simple through line. And I wanted you to really lurch. 
sort of what they do in Game of Thrones with the colored filters. I wanted to do that, but with language. Um, so with, in the race chapters, I just tried to kind of tuck in things or, or, or write it in a way that kind of embodied an immigrant's way of seeing things and maybe would allow you to feel what he felt. Um, and then in the Texas chapters, some people who read this early were like, your language is not as good as in your first book. Um, it's strange, you should be better, not worse over time. And uh, you know, I really tried to simplify and kind of capture the way people talked in that world, not just in the quotes, but a little bit in my own writing, mm -hmm. so that you felt that you were in that world when you were, when you were in that world. And the ending, you know, I, I fully share your view on saccharine endings, and I think, given that, I mean, to me, this book is not about these two guys. That's the secret. The book's about America and what is so amazing about it and what is you know, the threat to it. Uh, and there's no ending there. Um, so I didn't want the story about these two guys, which was really a story about something else, to end in a way that didn't befit what I felt was kind of a larger situation, which is a fundamentally ambiguous conclusion. So Mark Stroman, um, white supremacist, wannabe, um, in and out of jail guy, uh, has left us with a new generation of Strowmans. How are they doing? These are Mark's uh, three children. He has four. I spent time with three of them. Um, and one of the most astonishing, well, two things. One, surprise, surprise or not, um, they're kind of on the path to become like their dad. Maybe not murderers, but all wrestle with drug problems. Two of them have felony convictions. Um, one was still in jail when I was writing the book. The other was out of jail. His daughter was just out of jail for burglary. All, by the way, I, sh I haven't mentioned this yet, all about meth. This is all meth. Meth is eating, I mean, I've been in Lancaster, Pennsylvania a couple of weeks ago. We were driving across the wet, like meth, meth is one of the bigger stories in America that, that no one's telling. And, and you can just see it in these towns when you drive through them. Um, and so, so this is kind of meth land and his, his kids are really struggling. And one of the astonishing things that happened is Race Bouillon decides that it's not enough to try to save Mark Stroman. Um, he becomes determined to try to prevent the next generation of Stroman's from becoming like their dad, and he starts sending Amber Stroman, the eldest daughter, money. Um, and he calls her on the phone one day, and he, he says to her, you may have, uh, this is, uh, you know, I have to reveal that, that his campaign to save Stroman was not successful. Stroman was executed by the state of Texas. But still read the book. Exactly. <laughs> and Race calls Amber afterwards and says, I just want to tell you, you may have lost a, a father, but you've gained an uncle. There are times where he seems too good to be true, but then he's really not. In context, like, you, you get this guy, certainly by the end of the book. You know, he... I think if, if Mark Stroman was just a bone-rotten murderer, or if Race Bouillon was just an upwardly compassionate immigrant, this would be like a two-page article. Um, the reason it was able to hold my interest for a few years uh, was that these are wonderfully round and complicated characters, and they become rounder as the time goes. So th over the course of 10 years, they're maybe a little bit flatter characters. Um, Mark Stroman is kind of just a bone-rotten murderer, but over these 10 years on death row, Mark Stroman really becomes a better guy. All the bad people in his life leave. All the new influences in his life are kind of virtuous and wonderful. And he changes. He becomes self-aware. He doesn't become, you know, maybe as virtuous as you. Uh, but, but, he, but he... We've just met. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, he, uh, but he improves. And Race, who I think comes as a very pious, humble, simple immigrant, um, holds on to his piety and his virtue. But he starts to you know, play the American game and kind of acquire that American pragmatism. The first moment for me is when he's working at the Olive Garden and he learns that alcohol accounts for half of all tips. So sticks to his religion to the T and makes half the income of everybody else or a little bit flexible and doubles his income. And he thinks to himself, well, God wouldn't want me to starve. Um, <laughs> And to me, that's like the beginning of his American journey. Um, <laughs> he's not abandoning his religion. He's right. just expanding he it a little bit. He doesn't bit. imbibe himself. No, and, and will never, and will and never will. have a sip. But he thinks, you know, might as, and, and then he thinks, if I'm going to do this, I might as well be good at it, so becomes the highest grossing alcohol seller at the Olive Garden in Mesquite. Um, that's when I realize I love this guy. <laughs> he finds out all about the wines. 
different wines, where they're from, what, what's in cocktails. Whether they're crispy, chocolatey, or spicy. That, that was just three categories for wine. <laughs> and I thought, if you can do that without ever taking a drop, you're that kind of guy. And uh, he, he, yeah, I realized he was who he was. I, knew if, I felt like I knew him my whole life. And, and I think that, force, that little decision was maybe the first of those decisions in, in a series of recognitions that you can't just be about the other world, the next world, if you want to get stuff done here. So I think he, over the course of particularly his fighting his campaign, he retains this deep piety, but he kind of becomes, he gets a little American hustle in him. He, he learns how to play the game and talk to the media and get his story out there and talk like a politician. And, and he really learns to be both about the next world and very ambitious about this world. Um, and, and, and to me, that's kind of what allowed me to stay with them, that he's, you know, he's not just a pure, simple guy. He's a pure, simple guy who knew how to get you and I talking about him here today. Please, uh, questions for Anon? Since it's being recorded, we, we're forcing you to go to the mic. You can beatbox as well, whatever you. Yes, uh, uh, you mentioned something about second generation immigrants kind of losing the advantage of not being as involved with drug and alcohol ab abuse. Can you expand a little bit on that? I thought, I thought so, it was so an interesting subject. Yeah, I mean, actually we have Bob Steele here who probably knows this better than me because New York actually experienced this unexpected life expectancy surge um, some years ago. And, and it, was a, it was a pretty, I forget what it was, but it was like a five year surge from one census to another. And how are people suddenly living five years longer in New York City? And uh, it was found that it was you know, explainable almost entirely by the expansion of immigrants in New York and that immigrants <laughs> live longer. And so this was kind of a puzzle because immigrants come from generally places with poor healthcare systems and whatever else. Uh, maybe, maybe not poor healthcare systems, but poor other systems. Um, and um, so to the, I think pe demographers call this the immigrant advantage. And it's driven by a bunch of things, eating habits, but drugs and alcohol are a major, if you just look at the major things that kill Americans, um, you know, from like eating chicken fried steaks to, you know, doing meth, um, first, gen first generation immigrants are less likely to do a lot of those things that are the primary risk factors for for dying, they're likely to eat their traditional food instead of you know, Arby's or whatever. Um, and part of the great assimilation journey, and you know, what maybe what makes us a little bit different from a France or a Netherlands, is that within a generation or two, people start living in the American way, which we generally think of as a good thing. Uh, maybe they you know, stop, maybe that means in your family not going to the mosque as often, maybe it means eating what the other kids in school eat. Um, and so whatever the kind of avoidance of those risk factors was basically goes away after, I think, one or two generations. Um, and, you know, in a way, that's kind of the dark side of what we actually like about assimilation here, that people become American. Please, could you go to the mic? You can queue up at the mic if you want to be ready to load that next question right behind this guy's question. Um, <coughs> hi, Howard Gardner. Um, most of the people here, you know, live in the United States and we each have our own sense of what it is like to be a true American, probably not the same, but if it's true that the fish is the last to discover uh, that it's in water, and if your book is either read or translated into other countries and read elsewhere, what do you think is be the most difficult things for people to understand, whereas for most of us it would be pretty intuitive? Great question. Um, I think the, the violence that, is, that seems to be not just incidental to what goes on in America, but seems to some, in some way be part and parcel of the fabric of who we are. And uh, we were in Ellis Island the other day, and you know, as many times as you hear that, give us your tired huddle, when you go there and you see that, it's just, this, this country is astonishing. This country has declared to the world, like, give us the weakest among you and we will make them ours. And yet, this violence that we visit on each other, the, the kind of chaos that people like Mark Strom, I think people just find that mystifying around the world. Um, but if, if you're sitting somewhere else in the world watching Arnold Schwarzenegger destroy right. 50 people, you probably don't understand 
the class dimensions to that violence. Right. If you're upper middle class, you are now vanishingly unlikely right. to be visited with that kind of violence right. because this significantly less mixing right. uh, than there was, and a lot of places where there is mixing have gotten a lot safer. Right. If you're walking down Fifth Avenue, a working class person is not going to jump an upper middle class person and beat them up. It's just not going to happen. Now, people still fear that, right. but the sort of low level constant violence among uh, lower class people is really horrifying Absolutely. and has, has health effects and stress and, and right. all kinds of other things. Yeah. You're, you're waiting for the next beat. Yeah. And, and, I, and I think just to add to that, I mean, I think the, the other big thing is I think people have this sense that America is a place where anybody can go and change their fate in the, in the way that race expected to and, and did. Um, I think what may be less obvious to people is that there's an astonishingly large number of people for whom that's true and a very large number of people for whom that is utterly impossible. Um, and um, I think that's something that immigrants often just leapfrog over um, and don't even realize exists here. In a lot of the world, though, I think that stuckness is a feature of daily life, but it's already been internalized. Right. The great fortune of America is the relatively few people who've already internalized being stuck. And I fear that right now, it's growing. that's changing. Yep. That more people Absolutely. are realizing, oh, this is the game and I've already lost. I and think that's, that's scary. the most important change in American life today, what you just said. Well, it's, it's a frightening thing to me because one of our big advantages and the thing that keeps the person in the dead end job pushing ahead, even though they may find after 10 years they're tre they've just been treading water, is this belief that there is something better around the right. bend. And I shudder to think what happens when, when enough people check out of that. Yeah. It's a scary thing. Go to the Walmart in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, and you see, as far as I can tell by my eyes, a, a, a total world in which nobody expects to be able to change their fate, and the consolations have to be things other than climbing. David. Uh, thank you. I was uh, on, on that topic. How true do you think some of these things were about mobility or violence even in lower working class, low RCS working class American communities 50 or 100 years ago? So is this <coughs> distinction something that's always been with us? Um, that, you know, if you were cranking bolts in a factory in, you know, in the Midwest, that's what, you know, you're not going to ascend from that either? Or is this something really new and that meth and hopelessness and minimum wage are really a much larger story than they were a long time ago? I mean, I think you may have a different view. And I, I think the, I read a bunch of kind of social science on this while I was working on the book, and I don't get into it at all in the book, but just to inform myself, I think the big takeaway from, from that reading for me that, that totally resonated with this was, was not that this stuff didn't exist before, um, but if you think broadly about there kind of being a lower, a middle, and an upper class, very broadly defined, um, I think the kind of big change we're talking about is the, the pathologies of the very low um, starting to kind of climb up to the middle. Um, and this starting to kind of be a two-thirds, one-third society instead of one-third, one-third, one-third. Um, and that middle one-third are the people who got china and who got automated and who got, you know, uh, a lot of the forces of the last generation and the wage stagnation and labor participation and mass inca incarceration, all of that. Um, and so, you know, Charles Murray talks about this in Coming Apart. Bob Putnam talks about it from a very different point of view. But there's this sense in which middle class behaviors from marriage to church attendance, to any number of things, used to look a lot like upper class behaviors. And they now start to look a lot more like lower class behaviors. Yes. Uh, good morning. Very interesting. My name is Jack Lowe. I'm from Dallas, Texas. Welcome. <laughs> uh, sorry, Thank you for Jack. sharing your city with me. Yeah. <laughs> if uh, you were uh, czar, uh, what are the three things you would do to uh, reverse these trends? First of all, that would be a terrible appointment. Um, um, it's a great question, and I'm, you know, it's, it's, it's probably the thing I'm least good at is translating this into policy solutions, but, but I'll give you a few, because I am czar now. Um, 
you know, one is if, if we were in, let's say, France um, and had these kind of similar problems, I think we'd be in much deeper trouble because I think France does not have a thriving France on top that is the best in the world at whatever they do. We still have like a third of this country, and I really think it's a lot bigger than the kind of media narrative, that are the best institutions, the best companies, the best government service, like we, we complain about everything, but basically when you do most things in this country, they're actually just the best in the world. And I think most people here who come to this festival, whatever they work in, whatever company they're part of, are probably pretty close to the best in the world at whatever they do. And so we have a thriving America that can be plugged into the not thriving America. And I think most Western countries that are in decline don't have that situation. Spain does not have this layer on top that's the best at everything in the world. Um, and so one major thing is getting people from this thriving America to become interested in the failing America. I have a lot more people I went to school with who go to Rwanda and are very keen to save Rwanda. And that's great. It's great that we've become much more cosmopolitan as a country. But I don't know anybody, and I don't expect to know anybody who went to the schools I did, who would move to West Virginia or Kentucky and do some of the same work. But West Virginia and Kentucky are like peeling themselves off the map through, through kind of an implosion. So I think that's one. What problems do we choose to solve? Um, I think the second, and this is kind of obvious, but education. And I would say education in the context of my third point, which is family, I think we have to accept, although I don't love this thing, um, that a lot of our people going forward are not gonna have good parents. And that inequality and in access to decent parents, to my mind, is the most important inequality in America. I would love to narrow it, but I don't think we will in the short term. And so I think we have to start thinking about an education system that not only does better at what it's trying to do now, but actually takes on the much more ambitious goal of trying to make kids whole, even if they have horrible parents who are in drugs, on drugs or in jail. That's the reality. And, and we're not, the school system hasn't taken that on as its challenge, but it is its challenge by default. And the third thing is family. And, I, and I'll say, I think, you know, this is something where really the Aspen Institute is very well positioned to, to think about it and the kind of people who come to this. The family is falling apart in America. And my own theory after working on this of why we're not doing anything is that this issue falls right in the cracks between the left and the right. And broadly, the left doesn't want to talk about some ways of living being better than other ways of living and having a family being better than not having a family. And it's very uncomfortable, very squeamish, and feels it's too judgmental. And there's a, and there's a rationale for that. The right cares a lot about those issues, but doesn't really win its votes from the most vulnerable and hurting people in the society, and that's not really its base. Um, and so the most vulnerable and hurting people who really lack access to families and children who really lack access to decent parents are just this concern that we don't talk about. Because either it's the Christian right saying everybody needs to have this cookie cutter family, or it's the left saying like, let's not stigmatize people. Um, and having had a family myself, I think it's kind of a great thing to have a, a good family. Isn't there also a class dimension in it's this. a hugely class, and, that's, and I think that's why it makes the left uncomfortable, and the history of racism associated with talking about the family. But it's not that we can't, you know, you have to be racist if you want to say that people having stable families is better than not. And it's, fortunately, it's not a race issue anymore at all, because the white family is failing as much as the black family or any other family today. You know, now 50% of births to young women are to unmarried mothers, right? So you don't get to that number with just minorities. Um, and so I think we need to have a really new kind of conversation in this country about what do we do about the family that's neither, you know, focus on the family's approach nor a kind of liberal, like, anything goes approach. Uh, <coughs> so I think I'm going to be long-winded because I'm just trying to structure my question. Uh, I'm a Dominican immigrant, so all these topics uh, really hit home. And I have to be honest, I didn't know it was a book conversation, so I'm glad that we are talking about a book because I'm going to go ahead and check it out and read it. Uh, but the book... That was uh, the idea, Luca. Yeah, so thank you, yeah. So, but the book touches, for me, uh, sort of the larger conversation, which I think um, it symbolizes very well, this, this battle about who is America, right? And so it's a cultural battle. But that cultural battle has a lot of um, policy implications, government implications, uh, how we uh, li live our daily lives, how we deal with our neighbors. Um, and while 
in the story, you have this protagonist who is, you know, sort of quintessential white American uh, victim of the circumstances of the last 20, 30 years. <clears throat> there is uh, a lot of a lot of his ideologies about being true American. I would say are maintained by folks who are educated, and and, and so for example, I had to fight when I was running a nonprofit in Louisiana. Uh, one of our senators, we didn't win, but we definitely fought the state legislators and we did win when they were promoting anti-immigrant bills, right? Um, so all this fear about immigrants, what is, that, what is that about? Oh, they're gonna take our jobs, they're not like us, what, they're, gonna, they're gonna change our way of life. All of these really broad strokes about really fa fear-based ideas. Um, so as journalists, right, uh, where is that fight in terms of when are we gonna sort of get to a place where we're not afraid of these newcomers. That we've had newcomers forever in this country. This country's built on newcomers. To me, I think the big difference between, say, 19th century immigration and 21st century immigration is the color. Uh, and so where Irish and Italians could, over time, assimilate much better because they're still white, Looking, just they had to become white. They, they were not yeah, exactly. often considered no, right. white. Initially not. So I mean, for, for example, I'm familiar with the stories in New Orleans where Italians were, um, you know, ostracized when they first came into New Orleans, but eventually they become the folks that do the ostracizing, right? So they, can, they have that level of being able to assimilate at a, at a much, let's say, easier, in a much easier way than people of color like yeah. myself and you. Let me respond to you this way if I can. You know, I, I, think, I think part of the problem here is, as, as with the left-right thing on the family, we have two ways of thinking about this that are very extreme and not in conversation with each other. And, and kind of, if you have one view, you like don't tolerate the other view. I would say both views are true, and, I, and, and I'll tic articulate them as best I can. And I think race and Mark embody them, sort of. I think one view is this country is all about new people. It's always had new people. It's had wave after wave of new people. It's the best you know, uh, new people conversion machine in the history of the world. And that's the essence of it and the most valuable thing. That's a great view. but. If America was only about new people, there's kind of no place for people who were born here, and that's not necessarily a satisfying narrative for everybody. The other view is that you're kind of best if you got here first, right? Um, but I think the kind of intellectual kernel in that that's a little bit more reasonable is the idea that when change is too precipitous, societies don't have a thread, they don't have a culture, they don't know who they are. Uh, Martin Amos, the novelist, you know, articulated this very beautifully. He said, you know, the quest fundamental question hovering over America, is it just a collection of immigrants or a country with a particular culture and soul? Um, and I actually think that's a good struggle. And I don't think, I mean, I, I come from a family of newcomers, but I, I, I actually don't think America should only be about newcomers and kind of be unmindful of how hard that is over the generations. And I expect, you know, it's part of the kind of DNA of my children will resent some other newcomers. And that's sort of, as long as we have to manage that, but that's sort of, we're people still. And you're never gonna legislate us out of being a little petty. Um, but you can have better laws that you know, keep our pettiness in our private thoughts or in the sanctity of our living room um, and not have them become policy. Um, but I think there is an actual genuine struggle here of good people on both sides of the left and right that are trying to, at some deep level, figure out how do you sustain this commitment to taking anybody, but still be some place about something. Um, and that's not easy. The book is The True American, Murder and Mercy in Texas. Please thank Anand Giridharadas. And Ray. And just coincidentally, there are copies of The True American at the back of the room, which we encourage you to acquire and read. And I'm sure Anand will write uh, a lovely inscription to you in whatever 